you can hear me, I need to hear some applause. Can you clap twice? Very nice. So my name is Shamama Bernie. I will be your MC this evening. We are very fortunate to have all of you here. Really, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy weekend to join us. Um, we have several audience members here of all faiths and cultures, um, especially recognizing some of our honored guests tonight, including Vice Mayor Laura Pastor for District 4, um, City Councilwoman Suzanne Clapp, Religious Service Commander Reverend Teresa Shackelford from the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, as well as Dr. Young, Commander of the Arizona Jails. And then of course, all the city officials present this evening, including members of the city, Scottsdale City Police and Fire Department. Um, if you'll all go ahead and stand, we just wanna take a moment to appreciate all that you've done for our community. All right, we're definitely all about applause tonight. I also wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all of the religious leaders here in the audience today, whether you're a reverend, a rabbi, or an imam, if you'll also go ahead and take a moment to stand up so we can also appreciate you and everything that you do for our community. All right, guys, thank you again so much. Tonight's event is intended to unite the community and celebrate our similarities. So just a, cute, a few housekeeping rules before we move forward. Please do take a moment to silence your cell phones at this point in time. Um, bathrooms are located outside the main doors towards my, my back, left and right, um, down the hall and to the right. Please follow the signs. Now we'll go ahead and get started with a welcome from our board president, um, Soheb Sheikh. Um, we wanna make sure and thank the, uh, take the time to thank the board of the Islamic community of Northeast Valley for hosting this free event for all of us. So at this point, let's hear from um, Brother Soheb Sheikh. All right, thank you, Sister Shamama. Assalamu alaikum and uh, good evening to all the guests. How are you guys doing tonight? All right, so I was standing there, I was looking around the room, a lot of cheerful faces, and there are a couple of anxious faces. So the only funny reason that I could come up with is either that person is a Pats fan or an Eagles fan <laughs> and worried about their team winning the Super Bowl next Sunday. Don't worry, you'll be fine. So let me get to what I want to say tonight. I want to keep it really short and sweet uh, so that we can get going. Uh, we have a packed program here. So dis distinguished guests, religious leaders, law enforcement officials, my fellow community members and our keynote speaker, Saad Ali Atai. I want to thank you all for joining tonight. It's, it's a great occasion. It's, I guess it's a fourth annual interfaith event and it's always a pleasure uh, to see all the wonderful people coming together. So by a show of hands, how many of you guys are showing up to this Islamic Center for the first time? Great job, volunteer team and outreach, amazing job. Give, your, give you guys a pat on the back. That's nice. And by a show of hands, how many of you guys is the first time ever in Islamic Center? That's about 25%, I would say. So welcome, special welcome to all of you guys. Feel comfortable, relax your shoulders. So again, on behalf of the entire community, I would like to express my deep gratitude uh, uh, to come share a meal with us of love, kindness, and compassion. And uh, the most important thing is we should understand all of us a, a little bit more, each of us. So if you see around yourself, the message is right here. I don't have to really say much. This is a picture worth a thousand words. I mean, as a follow-up team event, we can all take a panoramic view of this picture, autograph it, and send it to the White House. <laughs> and uh, I guess that speaks volumes. So. So you can see around yourself, you have people from all walks of life. We have different ethnic backgrounds, multiple faiths. It's, it's a very strong message, right? I mean, this is what this country is about. This is the real fabric of the American flag. So, uh, I mean, this should be a, a very, um, I, mean, I mean, a proud moment for all of us. And we should do these events more so often, not just in Arizona, but all over the country. So, so thank you again for joining us tonight. 
The message I want to leave you with, that I want to ponder from time to time, it is, it is this. And please pay attention for the next 15 seconds. It is absolutely essential to resist the forces of division that spread misunderstanding and mistrust, especially among the people of different religions. I'll say this one more time because this is the real message I want to leave you with. It is absolutely essential to resist the forces of division and that spread mis misunderstanding and mistrust, especially among people of different religions. Because the fact is humanity is bound together, not just by our mutual interest, but also by shared commandments to love God and the neighbor. Do you guys agree? So therefore, we should strive to continue to do more good in our societies because this is a time of a lot of anxiety and a lot of confusion, not just what is going around in our country, but all over the world in general. Right? So that's the message I want to leave you with tonight. And please ponder on that from time to time and take time to understand whatever faith you, you, you believe in, to understand the, the person in front of you, the, their point of view, their perspective. That's really, really important. It's not the mainstream media, it's the person who is following the religion or the belief can give you the real information. So let me just conclude with a few thank you notes. Um, we have a lot of law enforcement officials, so first responders, I mean, they, they, I mean, they put their lives on the line. It's a courageous job. So we should always thank them. Whenever we go to bed, we feel safe but it is them, uh, partly due to them, because of which we fail safe. So thank you, a tremendous thank you for all that you do, and uh, may God keep your family safe. And finally, I want to thank the volunteer team, the amazing job, the meticulous planning that has went behind to put together this beautiful site. So put your hands together for the volunteer team. Thank you. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the evening and the wonderful dinner. Thank you. All right, everyone, like our president said, maybe we can go ahead and take a selfie tonight and tweet it out to the world, spread some positivity. Um, at this point in time, I would like to invite our beloved Imam to the stage. Um, one thing that we do at all of our events, we do go ahead and start them off with a recitation of our Quran, which is our holy book. Um, we will, of course, provide English translation as well, so you know exactly what we're saying. Um, but again, it's with our um, Imam's leadership that we continue to have events like this, as well as the support of the board, of course. Um, but at this point, I would like to invite Imam Mutaz Mufta to the stage. Uh, salam, shalom, uh, good afternoon or good evening everyone. Um, I'm really so happy to see everybody here. It's such an honor, it's such a privilege to see all of you here tonight. Um, I always uh, put my life and I always uh, talk to the leaders like Ma uh, Pastor David and Rabbi Michael about what really or how much responsibility we all have for the humanity. Uh, Dr. Young and, and Chaplain Teresa you know, we all work for our benefit first, and the benefit of our children and grandchildren. It is a such responsibility, and I believe everybody here in the room and everybody around us, you know, need to take a, a role in that. You know, so many people around us, people have a beautiful heart, but just they only need to be educated. I'm not here uh, this evening to talk. I'm just here to recite some view verses, verses from the Quran uh, uh, to show uh, what Quran actually teaches Muslims about Jesus uh, because uh, a lot of people don't understand what Muslims believe about Jesus. So it is so important for everyone to know what Muslims believe and what Muslims, you know, uh, have about uh, different faiths and different uh, prophets. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ قالت الملائكة يا مريم إن الله إن الله يصطفاك وطهرك واصطفاك 
واصطفاك على نساء العالمين يا مريم قنتي لربك واسجدي واركعي مع الراكعين ذلك من أنباء الغيب نوحيه إليك وما كنت لديهم إذ يلقون أقلامهم أيهم يكفل مريم وما كنت لديهم إذ يختصمون إذ قالت الملائكة يا مريم إن الله يبشرك بكلمة منه اسمه المسيح عيسى بن مريم وجيها في الدنيا الدنيا والآخرة ومن المقربين ويكلم الناس في المهد وكهلا ومن الصالحين قالت رب أنا يكون لي ولد ولم يمسسني بشر قال كذلك الله يخلق ما يشاء إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يكون له كن فيكون ويعلمه الكتاب والحكمة والتوراة والإنجيل ورسولا إلى بني إسرائيل أني قد جئتكم بآية أني قد جئتكم بآية من ربكم أني أخلق لكم من الطين كهيئة الطير فأنفخ فيه فيكون طيرا بإذن الله وأبرئ الأكمه والأبرص بإذن الله وأبرئ الأكمه والأبرص وأحيي الموتى بإذن الله وأنبئكم بما تأكلون وما تدخرون في بيوتكم إن في ذلك لآية لكم إن كنتم مؤمنين إن الله ربي وربكم فاعبدوه هذا صراط مستقيم. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Imam, for that beautiful recitation. That, of course, was from his memory. I'm sure if we kept giving him more time, he would recite the entire Quran for us. But um, to keep tabs with what we have scheduled tonight, we did also want to hear from one of our youths um, who will provide us a translation for what we just heard in Arabic. Um, I'd like to invite um, our youth, Caden, we met to the stage at this time. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. And mention when the angel said, O Mary, indeed Allah has chosen you and purified you and chosen you above the woman of the world. O Mary, be devoutly obedient to your Lord and prostrate and bow with those who bow in prayer. That is from the news of the unseen, which we reveal to you, O Muhammad. And you are not with them when they cast their pens as to which of them should be responsible for Mary. Nor were you with them when they disputed. 
and mention when the angel said, O Mary, indeed, Allah gives you good tidings of a word from him, whose name will be the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, distinguished in this world and the hereafter and among those brought near to Allah. He will speak to the people in the cradle and in maternity and will be of the righteous. She said, My Lord, how will I have a child when no man has touched me? The angel said, Such is Allah. He creates what he wills when he decrees a matter. He only has to say, Be, and it is. And he will teach him writing and wisdom and the Torah and the gospel. And make him a messenger to the children of Israel who will say, Indeed, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. And in that I design for you from clay, that which is like the form of a bird. Then I breathe into it, and it becomes a bird. By permission of Allah, and I cure the blind and the leper, and I give life to the dead, by permission of Allah. And I inform you of what you eat and what you store in your houses. Indeed, in that is a sign for you, if you are believers. And I have come confirming what was before me of the Torah and to make lawful f uh, for you some of what was forbidden to you. And I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. So fear Allah and obey me. Thank you so much, Caden, for that beautiful translation. We appreciate it. All right, guys, now, um, alhamdulillah, which means with the grace of God, we have several wonderful um, speakers here tonight. So we want to make a, uh, give the opportunity to hear a little bit from each of them. So to better understand the contents of our holy book, I did also want to let you know that we will have free copies of the Quran um, in English. Uh, I know you guys are probably a little bit behind on your Arabic, but uh, we got them in English for you, so you'll be okay. So um, no, they'll be located at the tables near the door um, uh, in the back uh, towards the end of this event. Now, beyond the Islamic faith, we want to be all-inclusive this evening, of course, and so it is our pleasure to hear briefly from other religious leaders from our local community. First, we'll hear from Pastor David Felton, who has been serving at the Fountains, a United Methodist Church in Fountain Hill since 2006. Pastor David. Assalamu alaikum. It's an honor to be here tonight. Uh, as I drove up, I was reminded what a privilege it was for me to be here. I think it was in 2001 at the groundbreaking ceremony for this building. Uh, and to, over the years, as I've been at two different churches, watch this community grow and develop and blossom into the community that it is, one that I want to just take a moment and say thank you to for the amazing hospitality, for the outreach into the community that has become such an important part of my ministry at the Fountains and I know among many other faith communities because one of the greatest challenges we have, as we know in our community, is that we don't know one another and that we need opportunities to build relationships, to build trust, to build communication. And so not only events like these, which I've been privileged to be at a number of them, but imagine my surprise when I went to the ICNEV website and the community events and I opened up the pictures and there's a picture of a group from my church here at the mosque. Uh, and it just warmed my heart to know that this is a place that has been so intentional about reaching out into the community and has welcomed other people into the mosque in order for us to learn about one another. Uh, one of the other things that uh, we have uh, we've worked together on a community is that many of the members of ICNAV have been in our church as well. We have an annual interfaith Thanksgiving service. Uh, we have that on the Sunday before every Thanksgiving and you are most welcome to join us. And so that has been also an experience of interaction and community building. 
One of the things that's grown out of that is we used to have a dinners for six group at our church. I don't know if you do anything like that in your faith community where we randomly place six people or three couples or six singles, whatever, together, and they get together in one another's homes for dinner to share about one another's lives and get to know one another. This year, uh, at the uh, suggestion of one of our interfaith committed members, she said, why don't we make it go interfaith? And so this year, instead of uh, just celebrating our Praise Well with, rather, with Others efforts, we're also doing Eats Well with Others, and we've rolled out uh, our beta version of having groups of six from different faith traditions get together in one another's homes where over dinner we can learn more about one another. So this is a passion for me and I've been so grateful to have ICNEV, Imam Moataz, Azra Hussein, so many others as partners in this. But I have to say the last time I saw Shamama was at the fountains and we were wrangling 20 kids. Um, Shamama bought, brought a group of youth from ICNEV to the fountains. We had a group of youth um, and together um, we sorted, counted, weighed all of the food donations for uh, the Islamic Speakers Bureau's 9-11 food drive. And what was beautiful was um, all these kids who could care less about their differences of faith, they were all middle school and high school kids that were griping that their parents made them come to way food and all of that, and we're just looking forward to the pizza. Um, and so we played icebreaker games around the table where they had to answer questions from one another and get into small groups and interact with one another. It was just an amazing experience. And for me, it's just one of the things that we've had the privilege of doing together that shines a light on the promise for the future that we have hope for our community learning to appreciate one another, respect the humanity and the dignity of one another, and learn about who we are and where we come from so that together, as Americans together, we can celebrate one of those great gifts we have to the world, and that is coming together despite any religion, religious differences that we might have and giving one another a chance to learn to become friends, and to make this country a better place, not despite our differences, but because we take the time to learn about our differences and grow together. So thank you to Ima Motaz and the entire community here at ICNEV, not just for tonight, but for all the other ways that you have participated in helping enrich my ministry and help my people at the fountains grow in their spiritual lives. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Pastor uh, David, for that wonderful um, speech. And again, definitely, there are so many interfaith opportunities um, within all the different congregations in the surrounding areas. We definitely have to take more advantage of those. Now next, at this point, I would like to invite, invite Rabbi Wa Michael Wasserman to the stage, who has been serving at the New Shoal in Scottsdale since 2002. Rabbi Michael? It's an honor to be here, and I thank you also for your hospitality and in including me this evening. One of the greatest Jewish theologians of the 20th century, and also one of our greatest champions of interfaith dialogue and understanding, was Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. In the 1960s, Heschel wrote an essay called No Religion is an Island, and I'd like to read you some of his words. He wrote, the religions of the world are no more self-sufficient, no more independent, no more isolated than individuals or nations. Energies, experiences, and ideas that come to life outside the boundaries of a particular religion or all religions continue to challenge and affect every religion. Horizons are wider, dangers are greater. 
No religion is an island. We are all involved with one another. Spiritual betrayal on the part of one of us affects the faith of all of us. Views adopted in one community have an impact on other communities. Today, religious isolationism is a myth. Is it not clear that in spite of our fundamental disagreements, there is a convergence on some of our commitments, some of our views, tasks that we have in common, evils we must fight together, goals we share, a predicament afflicting us all? Heschel taught that the fundamental basis on which we ought to reach out to one another across the barriers of faith is first of all our shared humanity. The first thing that the Hebrew Bible tells us about human beings in the very first chapter of Genesis is that all people, all human beings are created in God's image. If we believe that, then we must believe that there can be no room in any of our faiths for bigotry, for dehumanizing others. On that basis alone, we must listen to each other with respect Another basis on which we reach out to one another, Heschel taught, is spiritual humility. He wrote that where we come together most deeply is, quote, at the level of fear and trembling, of humility and contrition, where our individual moments of faith are mere waves in the endless ocean of mankind's reaching out for God, where all formulations and articulations appear as understatements, where our souls are swept away by the awareness of the urgency of answering God's commandment. While stripped of pretension and conceit, we sense the tragic insufficiency of human faith. What he meant is that the God that we believe in is greater than any of the words through which we try to speak of God or any of the concepts through which we try to understand God. God transcends all religious language, all religious traditions. None of us, therefore, have a monopoly on God. In a spirit of humility, in the awareness of our spiritual limitations, we ought to listen and learn from one another. Almost 2,000 years ago, our sage Shimon ben Zoma taught, Ezehu chacham, Halomed Mikol Adam, who is wise, one who learns from every human being. In this era, when religious bigotry is on the rise around the globe, we have a special obligation to take those words to heart, to cultivate our sense of shared humanity and spiritual modesty. In this time, above all, may all of us be blessed with the humanity and the humility to listen and to learn from one another's voices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi Michael, uh, for that very thought-provoking speech. We do appreciate it. Now, no discussion on religion would be complete without a word on civil liberty, liberties awarded to us, and an organization that serves to protect them is the Council on American Islamic Relations, also known as CARE. Here from the Arizona chapter is the CARE board chairman, Dr. Yasser Sharif. Dr. Sharif? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ajma'een. All praises for God and blessings to the, present, to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you. And uh, before I get into the talk quickly, um, I just want to share a quick story. So sometimes I've been blamed not to talk loud enough, so please remind me. The story is basically very simple. Um, my, my wife and I were involved in uh, building a home recently, and um, if you know how the process goes, it is a little bit challenging. And uh, it's tedious, it's long, 
and uh, our neighbor, uh, Doug, made it a little bit more difficult. During the time, which took like a year, forever it seems, more than a year, um, we, we had a few dialogues and uh, on more than one occasion um, I expressed to him how I actually felt, which should not be wrote, <laughs> repeated in this honorable gathering. <laughs> so this was our first holidays in December and uh, we were out for about 10 days or so on vacation. And uh, we came back and we had a pile of mail which was ginormous, uh, even in this new, new place where we had just moved in. And as I was going through it, I came upon a very beautiful card sent by my neighbor Doug. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, remember that story because it did touch me. So I'll, I'll begin my thoughts here. Again, I want to thank God for giving us an opportunity to discuss this very important topic regarding interfaith work. I've been blessed with it, engaging on this platform at multiple levels and wonderful relationships have been forged every time we do this. This is what I would consider a grassroots opportunity with potential to grow and to find common grounds. Whether the interaction is within the Abrahamic faiths or generally in all faiths, the basic principle that we all agree upon is that we have the right to exist on the terms that we choose to exist upon. We have the right to exist on the terms that we choose to exist upon. Having said that, I want to remind us that our great country gives us this right in the form of civil rights. The First Amendment is clear. We have the freedom of expression or speech. We have the freedom of religion, assembly, and the right to petition the government. The government of the people, by the people, and for the people. To sum up Islam in a few words is not an easy task. But one word that no scholar of Islam would disagree is that Islam does stand for justice. The place I'm confident that all of our religions can make an impact on is social justice. I believe we can work on policies that will cut down on racism and, sex and sexism and, and inequality in access to social programs and education. I believe we can work together on promoting family values that keep the family unit together. I believe we can work together on, uh, on promoting family values that will keep the family unit together and help with raising children that are safe, that are well fed, that are well clothed, and well educated. I believe that we can work on improving access to health care so no one has to worry about the increasing cost of health care being a hindrance to becoming a productive member of society. I believe we can work together on improving educational systems so that religious studies are equally represented as secular studies. There are people who are constantly working in the education system to demonize or trivialize or marginalize religion and those people that speak on behalf of the religions. With the First Amendment on our side, this just cannot happen. All of us have to find that common ground and then work together to achieve this very real issue that is faced in academia. Scientific research and methodology is taught, but religious research and methodology is being cut out at a great rate. This is directly having an effect on ourselves and our children. As, as the large narrative of religion is taken out of context and then spun in such a way that the value of religion is taken out of society. 
I believe that is detrimental to our diverse and pluralistic society because some of the greatest values of ethics, love, mercy, togetherness, tolerance, peace, spirituality, personal responsibility, and many others are being lost completely. There's almost no standard of humanity, but rather a scale of dollars and cents, and percentages and scientific data. To be clear, I am not advocating getting rid of economics of social justice or science of implementing policies, but rather I'm trying to put value back in things that are not easily measured by the scientific method and cannot just have a random financial value. For example, what is the value of love? What is the value of breaking up a family? What is the value of drug addiction before the child is born and after the child is of school age? These are just some examples of where religion and ethics and morals can be an impactful part of the conversation and it can sway our opinion and give us a more comprehensive understanding and hence a very valuable input to society. I want to speak also on the great opportunity that's our constitution, that our constitution affords us by empowering us to actually know that each of us can make a positive difference. The Constitution that does, by promoting our individuality and protecting each of us from harm, should we speak outside of the common understanding. The Constitution empowers us to bring forth new ideas and innovations and tells us that we can promote it even publicly, as long as we do not impose others or harm others. This is truly the definition of freedom and something we should all be proud of. With all the common grounds that we have, all we need to do is put our egos aside and push forward to a new understanding and a better future. It says in the Quran, and I paraphrase in English. This is uh, chapter 41, verse 34. That's Surah Fussilat. Good is not equal to evil. So repel evil with what is best. So your enemy would become your friend. This is a religious Quranic value. My neighbor sent me a card and changed our relationship. Some people may know this, but many people need to live this. Like our leaders who attack first and think later about the consequences of the retaliation. I refuse to entertain the conversation that religion will take us back to some archaic way of existence. In fact, religion will push us forward to building the types of society that we are proud of and value in such a way where humanity defines the quality of society. Not the socio-economic demographic, not the sizes of the buildings of our community, not the sizes of our military or the technological advancements of our industries. I believe with religion we will be defined more on the way we love and forgive and live together and empower each other and work together and constantly improve the future generations and cut down on the shortcomings of individuals and the society as a whole. I want to thank you very much for your time and your attention, and may God bless you.
All right, thank you so much, Dr. Yasser, for that empowering talk. Um, all right, guys, so in the interest of giving you plenty of time to eat your food, what we negotiated is that we'll go ahead and switch up the program just slightly. We'll go ahead and go into the mosque next. As with sundown, it is our time to have our evening prayer. We'll also provide a short tour of our masajid or masjid. And then we'll come back and we'll give you plenty of time to get seconds, thirds, you name it. Okay, so at this point in time, I would like to request if everyone um, who feels comfortable in doing so will join us for a masjid tour as well as um, see us perform our Maghrib prayers. Thank you so much. Feedback forms for our event this evening. We purposefully are telling you about that feedback form after feeding you some good food. So please take that into mind. But no, at this point, um, what I really want to do is take a moment to um, tell you a little bit about our guest speaker, Dr. Ali Atai. He has an impressive biography due to his extensive studies in Islamic sciences, holds a PhD in Islamic biblical hermeneutics, and is a professor in a variety of subjects at Zetuna College in Berkeley, California, including comparative theologies and seminal ancient texts. Now, Dr. Ali Atai has over 20 years of involvement with interfaith activities and expert in mul multiple languages, including Arabic, Hebrew, Biblical Greek, and Farsi. So for your convenience, tonight's lecture will be in Farsi. <laughs> I'm being told no, no one got the memo on the Farsi, so we'll just stick with the English, Dr. Ali, if that's OK with you. So without any further ado, here's our guest for the evening, Dr. Ali Atai. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you. Thank you very much um, for that intro. I hope I can live up to it. Um, they say behind every great man is a woman rolling her eyes. <laughs> My wife is not here, so if she were, she'd be rolling those eyes right now. Uh, it's an honor to be here again. Um, with all of you, distinguished uh, guests and community leaders and members. Um, <clears throat> I'm given the topic of uh, similarities uh, in the Abrahamic tradition. This is a topic that I spoke on maybe last year when I was here or two years ago. I don't know. Time flies. Um, getting older. That's what happens. Um, and as you can tell, I'm somewhat of a techno peasant. I didn't know how to turn on a microphone. I just got an iPhone like a year ago. So I'm not on social media. So I'm living in the 80s, basically. And that, was a, that was a good decade, by the way. Wasn't it? What a simple time. Anyway, 49ers were good back then. You know? Man. Anyway, um, I want to begin by, uh, as I did last time I was here, I want to begin by telling you what I think to be the absolute heart of the Abrahamic tradition, right? So if you can sort of boil it down to one, one statement, one sentiment, one tradition, what would it be? So I think in the Jewish tradition, um, and I've seen this ascribed to multiple rabbis, I've read Hillel, I've read Akiva, um, I've read uh, Gamaliel, I'm going to go with Hillel. Um, and uh, Rabbi Wasserman, if you're here, you can correct me. That Hillel was asked, what is uh, the most important, what is, what is the Torah in a nutshell? Right? If you can describe the Torah. The Torah is something that Muslims uh, believe in. It's mentioned in the uh, Quran, um, but it's not that simple. Um, maybe we can get into some of that in a Q&A session. Uh, but, so, Hillel said, he quoted uh, from three verses from the Torah, Deuteronomy 6.4, which sounds like this, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
And then he read the next verse. And you shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and strength. And then Leviticus 19, 18. And love your neighbor as yourself. Right? And then he reportedly said, everything else is kind of commentary. Right? <laughs> not to say it's not important, but he's giving you the, the essence of the tradition. Now, what's very, very interesting is, <clears throat> and, you know, I teach comparative theology, I teach comparative literature. What's interesting is that you have an almost identical story in the New Testament Gospels, right? So you have in the Gospel of Mark a Jewish scribe coming to Jesus, peace be upon him, and saying to him, what is the greatest commandment, right? And what does Christ respond with? The very same three verses. Say, O Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Um, now, one of the greatest theologians in Islamic history uh, was named Fakhreddin al-Razi. Um, I'm not going to ask you to repeat the name. But he was a Persian, which means he was brilliant. I think, I think there's another Persian in the house tonight. Oh, okay, there's, there's more than one Persian, actually. Whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, he was asked, what is Islam in a nutshell? <laughs> so he said, in the Arabic language, he said, uh, Al-Islam al-ibadatu lil-khalq wa rahmatu lil-khaliq. I'm sorry, uh, al-ibadatu lil-khaliq wa rahmatu lil-khaliq. Yeah, not the other way around, this way. He said, it is to worship the creator, ibadah, to worship the creator, and to show compassion and mercy, rahma, compassion and mercy to his creation. This is the Islamic faith in a nutshell. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who Muslims believe to be the final uh, prophet with a capital P, so Muslims have a very, like Judaism, a very uh, specific definition of a prophet with a capital P, one who receives revelation from God. He said, لا تدخل الجنة حتى تؤمنوا ولا تؤمنوا حتى تحبوا. He said, none of you, and a lot of Muslims don't even know this tradition, right? I actually, when I, <laughs> when I speak to Muslim youth, um, I... A, take a show of hands, how many can actually quote one hadith, one tradition of the Prophet Muhammad in Arabic, and very few of them can actually quote one hadith. Right? This, I was sort of inspired to ask them because I read a, um, a, uh, a, an article in a Christian magazine. I forget the name of the magazine, but the article was called The Greatest Book Never Read by a Christian journalist. And he actually says in there that he went to churches at random and asked parishioners coming out of the church to name the four Gospels. And he said 50% of them could not name the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And I thought, oh, that's kind of strange. I think I'll try something like that. So I speak to high schoolers and college Muslim students, and I say to them, uh, who can name one hadith? And everyone's like, uh, it's about maybe, maybe 25, 30% that can name them. So it's important to know... If you want to understand the ethos of Islam, we have to understand the ethos of its founder, as it were. So he said, none of you will enter paradise until you, uh, until you believe. And none of you will believe until you love one another. Until you love one another. And it is reported by exegetes of this hadith that one of the companions of the prophet, uh, when he heard that from the prophet, he said, yeah. He put his hand on his brother next to him and said, I love my brother. I love him. And the prophet said, that's good, but uh, it doesn't simply mean love for your brother Muslim, but a love for humanity, a love for Bani Adam, the children of Adam, right? So in this context, being good to your neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself, your neighbor doesn't simply mean your next door neighbor, right? Um, it means your fellow human being. So I think this is important. So this, I believe, is the heart of the Abrahamic tradition. The oneness of God, the love of God, honoring God, and uh, 
showing compassion and mercy to God's servants, right? Now, in principle, I believe that Jews, Christians, and Muslims, I believe that they worship the same God in principle, the God of Abraham, the God of many names, right? In Semitic languages, um, the word for God usually has the Alif Lam or the Alif Lamed, so you find variations of that. You'll find, for example, El or Eloh in Hebrew, Elohim, sometimes in the plural, a pluralis majestatis, as it were. In Arabic, Allah, again, the Alif Lam at the beginning, Allah Ha, Syriac or Aramaic. Uh, you'll find different variations in ancient Canaanite, in Ugaritic, in Akkadian, right? God has other names as well. The Tetragrammaton, of course, uh, yod heh vav -Hey, um, which is pronounced as Adonai. Uh, these are special names of God. There's an opinion that maybe Elohim is um, the sort of uh, a, a denotation of God's transcendence, while Adonai denotes his imminence or vice versa. And there are many names of God in the Quran as well. So it's the same God, the God of Abraham. If you read the Quran, even sort of a cursory reading of the Quran will give you the firm impression that the Muslims, that the, that the, the God that the Quran is saying is God, is the God of Abraham. You'll find stories of Abraham in the Quran. Sometimes the story, you'll find a parallel in the book of Genesis. Sometimes you'll find a story you won't find in Genesis. Sometimes you'll find something about Moses that's in the Talmud and rather than in the uh, Torah. You'll find um, stories about Jesus in the Quran. Sometimes you can find uh, sort of an intertextual allusion to something in the New Testament. Sometimes you won't find anything in the New Testament. Sometimes you'll go to an apocryphal gospel and you'll find something similar there. So it's a very interesting book, the Quran is. But in principle, it's the same God. Now, when you get down to sort of the theological nitty-gritty, right, um, uh, there are differences, right? And I think the worldview of Islam and Judaism and Christianity is not one of relativism. It's not that, I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh, there's no objective truth and there's no objective truth or morality. Um, that's sort of a um, that's sort of a, an epistemology that you'll find nowadays coming out of uh, the Western Academy, this type of postmodern philosophy that there's nothing normative, there's uh, every, you know, to each his own and everything's relative, right? I think that the worldview of the Quran and the Bible is one of pluralism, is a difference between being pluralistic and being relativist, right? I think in the Quran, there's room for other religions, and the Quran recognizes that there's other religions and that these other religions will always be there, right? In fact, if you look at the Prophet's life, and sometimes scholars divide the Prophet's life into sort of two, uh, two sort of sections, the Meccan uh, section of the Prophet's life, right? Where he was living in Mecca, he was being persecuted, about 13 years from the time he received the prophetic call when he was 40 years old until the age of 53. They were a small minority living amongst idolaters in Mecca. And then he immigrated to a place called Medina where he was the head of state. Sometimes scholars, they describe the first uh, term, the Meccan term, as being Isawi or Christic that the prophet in Mecca is very Christ-like. And his philosophy was, or his methodology was, what Martin Luther King called assertive nonviolence, right? So this is a lesson for Muslims living in a non-Muslim majority country is to practice, and the prophet is our example. The Quran says many, many, many times that the prophet is an instructive example for you. The prophet in Mecca practiced assertive nonviolence. What does it mean to be assertively nonviolent? It means to be totally nonviolent, absolutely nonviolent, yet principled and devout, right? To be principled, you know. So one of the interesting ways that <clears throat> there was a Christian author named Walter Wink, he wrote a book called The Radical Third Way. He interprets the um, statement of Christ on the Sermon on the Mount in very interesting ways. You know, turn the other cheek. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, offer him your left. Right? Some, you know, read that and they say, oh, that's, you know, that's just, I mean, what is that? I mean, Christopher Hitchens said this is immoral and it's, it's you know, suicidal, teaching people to be docile like this. Right? But it's interesting how some Christian theologians actually look at that, uh, look at that statement from Jesus. 
that if you look at the context of the times, um, uh, Israel at the time was a colony of Rome, and in Roman culture, it was actually seen as uh, improper to touch another person with your left hand. Your left hand is used for other things, right? You don't touch another person. With you. And then Romans, uh, when they would fight other Romans, they would punch with the right hand, like a right cross or an uppercut. And that sort of demonstrated equality amongst them. But to their subjects, in this case Jewish subjects, they would not punch with their right hands because that would recognize them as being equal. They would give them a backhand with their right hand. Right? So you take a backhand with, your right, with someone's right hand, right? They strike you on which cheek? Backhand. On the right cheek, right? So he says, someone strikes you on the right cheek, offer him your left. Now you offer the left cheek, right? Which means what? That he's either going to punch you with his left hand, which he won't do because that's improper, right? Um, or he's, sorry, he's going to give you a backhand with his left hand, or he's going to punch you with his right. In other words, force the oppressor, as it were, to treat you like a total human being, right? Without being violent whatsoever. Force him to deal with you as a total human being, as a complete human being, right? So this is assertive nonviolence. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in Mecca, you know, he did not compromise with his theology and with his morality because he believed it was from God. We don't need to compromise. We can have differences, right? The Quran says, say to those who disbelieve, lakum dinakum waliyadin. Lakum dinakum waliyadin means you have your religion and I have mine. The purpose isn't to sort of synthesize all these religions, combine them all, right? Uh, no, that's not the point. The point is to live with our differences. You have your way and I have my way. You have your theological beliefs, or lack thereof, and I have my theological beliefs. You're, you have your ideas of what is moral and what is immoral, and I have my ideas of what is moral and what is immoral. You have your ideas of what, is, what constitutes nature or nurture, and so do I. The Quran actually says in a Meccan verse, فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ Whoever wants to believe, let him believe. وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُكْفُرْ And whoever wants to disbelieve, let them disbelieve. Right? People should have a choice. لا إكراه في الدين. The Quran says, and this is a very, very uh, strong statement in Arabic. If you study Arabic grammar, this لا here, لا means no, also in Hebrew means no. But this لا is a type of لا that is prohibitive, absolute negation. There is never, in other words, any type of compulsion in religion. You can't force someone to believe in something. It doesn't work like that. That's not faith. Right? I can't force you to believe in it. I can't force you to believe the moon is made of cheese. Right? I can, I don't know, physically hold you down or something and say, admit it, the moon is made of cheese. You can say, okay, but that's not in your heart and that's not faith. That's just on the tongue. So there's no way you can force someone to believe in anything. There is no compulsion in religion. This fundamental concept in Islam. So the prophet in, in Mecca is Isawi, he's Christ-like. When he's in Medina, the Muslim scholars, they say he's very mosaic. He's like Moses. And some uh, um, Muslim theologians, they like to find sort, sort of prophecies or typologies or indications of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the previous dispensations, very much like early church fathers did with Jesus. Right? Typologies, like how do you make sense of the crucifixion, for example? Oh, if you look at Isaiah chapter 53, there's someone called the suffering servant of Isaiah. Typology of Christ. Uh, G Genesis 22, the Akeda passage. Abraham, you know, puts wood on his son's back, marches him up a hill, is going to sacrifice him. Sort of a dress rehearsal of what happened to the crucifixion. So some Muslim theologians engaged in that as well. So in uh, the book of Devarim, or Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, it says that a prophet will come like Moses and God will put words into his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that God commands him. Uh, so in Medina, the prophet is uh, very mosaic. So he's the head of state. So now assertive nonviolence, right, no longer works um, as far as 
uh, if there's an attack on the city, the prophet must defend the city. There's always an encouragement to forgive people, right? And the Quran actually quotes the Lex Talianus, right? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But if you forget, if you forgive, it says. But if you forgive, that is better for you, right? So now, the prophet in Medina is constantly being attacked by the idolaters of Mecca. There are traitors within the city. There are, um, there are treacherous elements within the city. Um, there are uh, invasions coming from the north. Uh, so the Muslims in Medina literally had to dig a ditch around Medina to keep out the invaders. Now it's a tempered resistance, right? That's why in Islamic law, there are rules of engagement, right? Rules of engagement, how to deal with um, conflict, military conflict. Now, that has absolutely nothing to do whatsoever for Muslim minorities living in a non-Muslim majority country. It's not even studied, right? So if you go uh, to the books of Sharia, right? Sharia means sacred law, you know, Sharia, right? Sort of a buzzword nowadays. You have Sharia, and if you look at the very back of the curriculum, you'll find something called the, uh, the penal code or the penal punishments or whatnot. That has absolutely nothing to do with Muslims in America. Absolutely nothing to do, because the Muslims in America are not uh, in any type of political position to implement these, these laws of the Sharia. So these are seen as uh, more symbolic, right? And you'll find these things in biblical text as well. And Jews and Christians have different ways of dealing with these texts, problematic texts within the scripture, uh, texts that require a, a lot of um, a sophisticated analysis. You have to look at context. I'll give you an, exam an example of context. Um, and maybe I told the story last time I was here, but I have to tell it again. I can't resist that I was in a, I was in a church one time, and we were having an interfaith dialogue in the church. And uh, when I walked out of the church, there was another church that had come into the parking lot and they had bought uh, a, a news camera. And this other congregation that was there was very upset at me, upset with me, because I was having fellowship with this other church. So they said to me, what are you doing in a church? And I said, I'm, we're having interfaith dialogue. They said, no, you're, you shouldn't do that. You're a Muslim and this and that. And it was very strange to hear that. And of course, people at the church I was with started defending me and whatnot. But anyway, uh, an old woman from <laughs> their church came to me in the parking lot and she said, why did your prophet go into Europe and kill all of the Europeans? <laughs> you probably heard this story. It's probably the most, my wife would be rolling her eyes right now. <laughs> so this story again. She said, why did your prophet go into Europe and kill the Europeans? I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Really? She said, she, said, it's very, it's, she said, quote, it's very well documented. It's like, I, I don't, unless my prophet's in Napoleon or something, I, I don't know what you're talking about. So I said to the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he did not leave the Arabian Peninsula, his entire 23-year ministry, as it were. He didn't leave the Arabian Peninsula. And she said, I don't know about that. And then she said, what about this verse in the Qur'an? So the verse in the Qur'an that you can translate as saying, uh, slay the unbelievers where you find them. Right? There's a verse that you can translate like this in the Qur'an. So I said to her, oh, okay. You know, you know that every single verse in the Qur'an has a context. I told my students at the college, the first rule of Islamic hermeneutics is context. And the second rule is context. And the third rule is, you don't talk about Fight Club. No, context. <laughs> exactly. So and this is a whole, I mean, if you're going to be an, a Muslim exegete of the Quran, you are required to study something called Asbab al-Nuzul and Sirah and um, uh, Nasr and all of these different sciences that go into the Quran uh, in order for you just to understand um, what is the Quran actually saying. There are many verses in the Quran that require sophisticated explanation. There are other verses that are easily understood according to the Quran. There's actually a verse in the Quran that says there are verses in this book that are called muhkamat, easily understood even in translation. There are other verses in this Quran that are mutashabihat, which means very elusive in meaning. 
right? So how do we understand these verses? We have to go through the prophet's sunnah, the prophet's uh, normative ethos, the prophet's uh, example that he gave us. How did the prophet interpret these verses? Anyway, so I said to her, you know, there's, there's context. Context is king, right? Uh, and then to demonstrate to her the importance of context, and she was holding a Bible. I said, can I see your Bible? And she said, here you go. And I said, you know, what, what about here in Luke 19.27? where Jesus says, those enemies of mine that do not wish me to reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. You understand this? She didn't, she didn't understand the, the Queen's English, right? <laughs> she said, what? And so, <laughs> my, my dad, right? He wants to read the Bible. This was a few years ago. He wanted to read the Bible. And so I gave him, I don't know what it was. I think it was an NIV or something. And he said, I don't understand a word of this. It, it, the English is too hard. So I actually went to Barnes and Nobles and I got him, I don't think there's Barnes and Nobles anymore. I think it's an extinct dinosaur. It's like a triceratops. Anyway, so I bought him, bookstores are extinct. So I bought him a uh, Berenstein Bear translation. There's a Berenstein Bear Bible for children. And I gave it to him and uh, I, I took the cover off, but there's still pictures inside. <laughs> So I couldn't hide. Anyway, so he, he liked, so I quoted to her the Berenstein Bear translation that said, whoever does not want me to be king over them, something like this, it's not verbatim, uh, cut their throats in my very presence, Luke 19, 27. And I expected her to say, oh, whoa, whoa, I see what you did there. You're taking it out of context, right? And I was, but that was the whole point. But she said, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> and I showed it to her. It says right here. And then what she did was she, <laughs> she, she looked at it and she closed it and looked at like the cover, like, it, like sh I switched the Bible. <laughs> she was like, that's odd. And, and then she smiled at me and she said, I'll never forget it. She said, I know who you are, Satan. <laughs> So, I didn't know what to do at that point. <clears throat> what could I have done? I don't know. I was, I was sort of dumbstruck at the time. Um, <clears throat> but context is very, very important. Now, what's interesting is when the prophet went to Medina, and now he has to engage in tempered resistance, and rules of engagement were given, rules of a just war, and I don't know if there's a just war anymore in the world based on modern weaponry. My stance is that all modern warfare is immoral. That's my personal stance. Uh, but anyway, um, when he went to Medina, uh, verses were revealed to him from God, according to Muslims, that gave him permission now to uh, physically defend the Muslim community. And the verse that was revealed to him is in chapter 22 of the Quran, verse number 39. It says, All of the verbs are in the passive voice. Right? Permission is given to those who are being fought against because they were wronged. Right? They were wrong. They can defend themselves. The next verse, verse 40 of chapter 22, gives the sort of reason, the initial impetus for this uh, for the permission of temporal or um, a tempered resistance. It says, if God did not check one people against another, in other words, if God did not reveal uh, rules of engagement that are just, then you would have seen many synagogues, monasteries, churches, and mosques completely destroyed where the name of God is glorified. This is a verse in the Quran, chapter 22, verse 40. The initial impetus for armed resistance given to the Muslims was, express it, was expressly to uphold religious pluralism in the world, to make sure that mosques and synagogues, churches and monasteries remain standing. And the word here, there's also, I mean, I translated monastery, but the word is really temple, right? A temple to God. There's a phrase in the Quran that says, Ahlul Kitab. You'll find this, it's a construct phrase, 
right? Ahlul Kitab, it's translated as people of the book, people of the book. And the initial exegetes of the Quran, they'd always translate that as people of the Bible. Because the word Bible, Biblion, means book. In Arabic, Al Kitabul Muqaddas, the holy book, is how you say Bible. So initially, Muslim exegetes would say that when the Quran says Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book, it means the people of the Bible. Now, a uh, later generation of scholars, <clears throat> they realized that there's a lot more religions out there other than Judaism and Christianity. So the exegetes of the Quran, they expanded the meaning of Ahlul Kitab to mean any religion that reveres some sort of scripture. So Zoroastrians, Buddhists, Hindus, etc. Right? So this is why you find, this is something interesting. There are a lot of problems in the Muslim Ummah. Right? This is true. In the Muslim nation. There's no doubt about it. There are a lot of problems in the Muslim majority world. Um, but it's interesting that you'll find a church in every single Muslim majority country, except for two countries, you'll find a church. I was in Yemen, I saw monasteries, I met uh, nuns and priests, right? There's only two countries, Mauritania, which is in West Africa, and Saudi Arabia, right? And Saudi Arabia is a little weird, right? But it's interesting, Saudi Arabia, there's no churches, but there are two, there are, what? There are two million Christians living in Saudi Arabia, but there are no churches. And most of them are foreign workers, which means per capita, per capita, there are more <laughs> Christians in Saudi Arabia than Muslims in America, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. But if you look at, if you look at um, historical Christian communities, if you go to Egypt, right, the Coptic church in Egypt, according to them, was founded by St. Mark. Their church has been there for 2,000 years, right? If you look across North Africa, you know, there's a book that was written, a very uh, popular book, uh, Answering Islam. Now it's a big website. The author was Norman Giesler, and he had a co-author named Abdul Salib or something like that. Even in that book, Norman Giesler, he says, this myth of, you know, Arab hordes, you know, coming across North Africa and slaughtering millions and millions of people. He said, that's a myth. He even says that, Norman Geisler. Now, of course, there have been, um, uh, there have been breaches of conduct, and of course that's happened. But Norman Geisler, he says here that the reason why people in North Africa actually became Muslim uh, in droves is because of low taxes, right? <laughs> and because of Islam's stress for brotherhood. Right? So you have these historical Christian communities. In Iraq, you know, you have uh, the ancient apostolic church of the East. And the Christians, uh, their, their liturgy is in, is in Aramaic. And they believe that their church was founded by uh, St. Thaddeus. Historical Christian communities. Unfortunately, a lot of these historical Christian communities are being persecuted by this uh, scourge upon the earth named ISIS. Right? That, in my opinion, has, has no justification whatsoever based on what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, did during his life. And in, the, the foremost virtue in our tradition, in the Muslim tradition, is compassion, is rahmah, is mercy. And this is the core attribute of God as well. His overwhelming, uh, if you can say, personality trait, if you will, is his mercy, right? That's why Muslims, when, they going, when they're going to do something, whatever it may be, um, that they want to have sort of providence in doing, they say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the indiscriminately compassionate, the intimately loving. And this formula, in the name of God, the indiscriminately compassionate, the intimately loving, this formula prefaces every single chapter of the Quran except for one chapter. And in the Quran it says, God says about himself in the Quran, according to the Muslims, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ That my compassion, my mercy overrides everything. My mercy overrides everything. David says, Tov Adonai لِكُلْ In the Psalms. 
He says, the Lord is good to all. And his mercy, his rahmah, is over all of his actions. One minute, okay. Jesus says in Matthew, Ki chesed I require mercy, velozevach, and not sacrifice, vada'at Elohim me'oloth, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. This is the dominant personality trait of the God of Abraham, is rahmah, is mercy, is compassion, right? And prophets are simply reflections of the divine in a, um, in a, in a, in a, in a sort of human limited form. Because Muslims don't believe in divine incarnations, but they are incarnations of God's mercy and compassion, right? So prophets mirror their lords. And the prophet, peace be upon him, I'll end with this, the prophet in the thick of battle one time, with blood streaming down his face, he raised his hands. His companions thought that he was going to curse his enemies now. This is in the thick of a battle, right? And the prophet said, Allahumma hdi qawmi fi innahum la ya'lamun. The prophet said, oh God, guide my people for they don't know. Right? And this sounds very, very familiar to something in the Gospel of Luke. Right? Jesus forgiving his enemies. You know. So, I, th I have to stop now. And I have to make a hard stop at that 7.50 because I have to catch a plane. I have to be in class at 8 a.m. tomorrow in Berkeley. Um, so, wish me luck and Godspeed. But we do have some time for questions. Hopefully I've inspired enough controversy. <laughs> Maybe not. For some softball questions. Any softballs out there? Before we transition into the question and answer phase, let's take a moment to do a great round of applause for that awesome speech right now. All right, everyone. So well, the plan for the question and answer session, there are um, index cards, if you will, located at the middle of the table. If you'd like, go ahead and write down a question, and one of the volunteers will come by, grab that question, and we'll bring it to Dr. Ali. We'll also try and walk around with a microphone or two so that we can get these questions answered. Um, as Dr. Um, Athai mentioned, he does have to leave right around the 750 mark, so we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. Um, we'll also try and give you his kind contact information so you can continue to bug him with your questions beyond tonight. So I'll, I'll give the microphone back to Dr. Aliathai. Don't be nervous. Ask questions. I won't. Oh, no. no, not you, Dr. Ali. <laughs> Actually, you should not be nervous either. I know. Okay. Uh, we have a question here. Why, uh, why say peace be upon him when mentioning Muhammad's name, peace be upon him? Well, I should have said this for every prophet's name. And sometimes I don't say it for other prophets. So tisk tisk on me. So this is something that um, uh, when, when, uh, when God in the Quran in a, in a few places mentions the names of prophets, he sends his peace upon them. Right? His peace, his salutations. So uh, to honor the prophets as the paragons of humanity, um, as the most uh, perfect human beings to ever walk the earth, uh, when we mention their name, Muslims should send blessings of peace upon them, right? And this is something that even in the Jewish faith, if you read Maimonides' 13 principles of, of Judaism, when he mentions uh, Moshe, he says, Alayv hashalom, alayv hashalom, Moses, peace be upon him, peace be upon him. Uh, as a way of honoring the name of Moses, peace be upon him. Oh, this is not. This is kind of a fastball here. Why do men not cover their heads? What's up with that? Okay, so the traditional understanding of men and women in Islam is that men and women are different. It doesn't mean that one is essentially better than the other. Right? So Muslim uh, philosophers won't buy into this idea that, for example, gender is a social construct. It's all nurture. There's nothing nature. Muslims believe that there's hard wiring, that God, as it were, um, he created women <clears throat> in a certain way, and he created men in a certain way. So uh, rather than finding absolute egalitarianism between the genders, uh, there are going to be differences. So it's more equitable than egalitarian. So, for example, dress code is slightly different. 
Um, in Islamic law, uh, this is very, very rare, but it's in Islamic law, a man can marry up to four wives, but a woman cannot, right? However, a man must provide for his wife, even if she has a PhD or an MD. It is his duty. So you have equitable rights, but not absolute egalitarianism, right? Um, so when it comes to how men think, men, uh, they tend to be more visually oriented, I would say. So when we go inside the mosque, for example, if you were in the Musalla area, right, you would notice that the men are in front of the women. Why is that? Men are better. Not really. No. That's how some people want to think of it. But you'll find the same thing in an Orthodox synagogue. If you go to an Orthodox synagogue, the women are up looking through peepholes, right? They're nowhere to be seen, usually. Why is that? Because they just, they hate women. No, that's not it. Because Muslims and Jews believe, at least the Orthodox, many of them, Muslims traditionally believe, that there are differences in gender, and men can be very distracted when they see women genuflecting in front of them. And this is true, whether you want to admit it to yourself or not. Right? So it doesn't mean that one is essentially better than the other. It means that there are gender differences. The rods and cones of men and women interact with light differently. This is a fact. We have different physical... We have differences phys in physicality. We think differently. This is, at least this is a traditional understanding. It's not very popular, like I said right now, in Western Academy, because you have this idea of, uh, of postmodern thinking and philosophy that there are no differences, essentially there's no hard wiring. Um, but Muslims believe in something called fitra. Fitra means there's an innate disposition in every human being to, uh, to believe in the summons of true prophets. This is something that people are born with. It's not nurture. There is nurture. You know, there's socialization, right? But there's something that God uh, put inside every human being that uh, if it's exposed to a sound prophetic summons, a true message of God, that person will gravitate towards that message. Uh, this, I, I can't read it. I'm not trying to dodge this one. That disconnected tradition. I can't, I can't make sense of it. Why does, G why does Islam believe Jesus will be the one to return and not Muhammad, peace be upon him? Good question. So, <clears throat> the short answer is because the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that Jesus will return, peace be upon him. That's what he said. So this is something, this is an, uh, an element of Christianity that Islam uh, confirms and the second coming of Christ, which is called the parousia in Greek, uh, is intimated in the New Testament much more explicitly than in the Quran. In the Quran, you sort of have to, uh, you have to do a little bit of, I don't know if I'd call it hermeneutical waterboarding. You have to sort of torture the text a little bit, and then it'll say, Jesus is coming back. Um, but the hadith of the prophet, you see the Quran is supplemented with the hadith, the hadith is the statements and actions of the prophet that are rigorously authenticated with this process of authentication that we don't have time getting into. In the hadith of the prophet, there's many, many statements from the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that state explicitly that at the end of time, Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, the Messiah, and the Muslims believe that Jesus is the Messiah, this is his title, Al-Masih, mentioned in the Quran, that he will be the perfect opponent to an adversary who will come at the end of time, who is called Al-Masih Al-Dajjal, or the Antichrist, right? So while the Antichrist will teach that salvation is through the world, it's all through the, there's no afterlife, everything is through the world, carpe diem, just live it up. And the Prophet Muhammad, he said, the Antichrist has one eye. And some have taken this to be literal, some say what that means is, that the Antichrist, he has sort of a myopic way of looking at the world, which is only through the material world. He doesn't um, recognize the spiritual world. Whereas Jesus, he is the exact opposite of that. Jesus' message in his first coming, um, if you read Muslim literature about Jesus, 
There are a lot of hadith in our tradition, Muslim tradition of Jesus, and almost all of them are about uh, spirituality, about taskiyatun nafs, in other words, about purifying the lower self, about union with God, about loving people for the sake of God, about death and afterlife. So Jesus is at one sort of end of the spectrum, and then his adversary, the, the opposite of him, as it were, is on the other side of the spectrum. So he opposes this person, whether he's an actual person or a philosophy or a worldview at the end of time. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, sorry. Can we follow your teachings, my teachings, online? <laughs> online. Any books except, ah, okay. So, yes. Like I said, I am a technophobe. I may upgrade to techno-peasant. That's an upgrade, but probably not. But, uh, so there are a lot of videos of me on YouTube. I didn't post them. I don't know how to post anything. <laughs> but I did a class called The Bible Through a Muslim Lens. You can find this online. It's a 15, uh, maybe, no, actually, maybe, yeah, maybe 15 week course. Has anyone taken it? I, I met someone earlier. Anyway, he left. Or he was lying. He's like, oh, no, I'm, not me. Um, so uh, I would, you know, start with that. I think it's um, going to be very, very informational um, uh, for Muslims and non-Muslims alike. And I have other things on, online as well. Um, so I, I would start with that. Mm. Let's go to this pile. How are we doing on time? How can we be sure that hadith is the right one, not fake or weak? This is probably a question that is going to bore every non-Muslim in the room, and even some Muslims probably. Uh, so very quickly, uh, there are several things that make a hadith strong. The first thing is an unbroken chain of narration, which is called a sanad. There can't be any gaps in the sanad and what constitutes a gap. There are many different things. Everyone in the Senate or the chain of the Hadith has to be known and recognized. They have to be known as a truthful person. Um, uh, the Hadith has to be traced all the way back to the Prophet. Even if all of that is sound, if the Hadith contradicts something in the Quran, then that compromises its soundness. And there's other things as well. I don't want to go into it right now. What sections of the Quran are recommended reading for non-Muslims? Well, I would get a Qur'an called The Essential Qur'an by uh, Thomas Cleary. So, remember what I said earlier? I said the Qur'an is at times a very difficult book. There are verses in the Qur'an that on its surface uh, might horrify you, just like there are verses in the Bible and the verses in Aquinas' or there are statements in Aquinas' Summa Theologica or things in the Talmud that on its surface are just going to horrify you. So they require a type of sophisticated exegesis. But what Thomas Cleary managed to do with the essential Qur'an is sort of give you the essence of the Qur'an that is easily understood in one volume. So that's, that's a book I would recommend for you. The Essential Qur'an by Thomas Cleary. <coughs> Why does Islam believe in plural marriages? Interesting Mormon terminology. <laughs> <coughs> Why does it believe in plural marriages? Well, I think it's important to, um, to understand, again, the context of this, of this law. So in the pre-modern world, men go to war, they would be killed, there'd be a surplus of women. And in fact, this ayah in the Quran, this verse in the Quran, which is in the fourth chapter of the Quran, was revealed during a wartime situation, right? So there's, in the pre-modern world, women usually don't work. Very seldom are they educated. Um, so that's why uh, um, uh, repudiation of one's wife is something uh, frowned upon um, in all three religions uh, because it sort of leaves a woman out to dry. She needs to get married again quickly or else how is she going to support herself? She needs to go 
back to her father or find an older brother or something like that. Uh, so the Quran has uh, made an uh, exception to the rule. The Quran says that the rule is one. Fawahida, one is the rule. But if there's a surplus of women because there's a battle or something like that, then you may w marry up to four women. However, by consensus, the scholars of Islam say that although there's a specific um, occasion of this verse's revelation, there's a transcendent um, aspect to the verse. And if a man and, a, and his family is willing to engage in polygamy, then they're certainly allowed to do that, although they cannot break the laws of the country that they're living in. So if the country does not allow it, uh, then they cannot do that. So one of the mandates of the Sharia or sacred law is that you cannot follow the sacred law if it breaks the country, if it breaks the laws of the country that you're living in, right? So again, this is very, very rare. It's based on a pre-modern uh, um, reality. But Muslims do, I mean, I've met a few people in my travels around the Muslim world that were in plural marriages, right? Um, but it's very, very rare. <coughs> Uh, huh? Sorry. <laughs> ah, in your honest opinion, I'll try to be honest. How do we end the ISIS terrorism? <sighs> oh. Yeah, I think ter terrorism is. I think, I think, I mean, we can call it terrorism, it is terrorism, but I think a sort of broader uh, topic or broader title for it is um, extreme ideologies. Extreme ideologies is a problem, right? Um, so whether it's national socialism or, um, you know, Soviet communism, I mean, if you look at, you know, people like to blame religion for things. Right? Religion is the cause of all evils, the root of everything. You know, th again, this sort of Christopher Hitchens, Sam Dawkins, uh, no, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris sort of line of reasoning. When you look at social sort of impact of religion, right? I mean, Mao and Pol Pot and Stalin confirmed atheists, but extreme ideologues, extreme ideologues, 100 million lives on their hands, right? So this is the problem, extreme ideology. So ISIS is an example of extreme ideology, and what manifests them, from them is terrorism. I think it has to be battled on two fronts. I think there needs to be an ideological refutation of their, of their theology. Uh, and I highly, highly recommend a text. It's called Refuting ISIS. You can find it. It was written by a great um, uh, Syrian scholar named Sheikh Mohammed al-Yaqubi. He's still living. He wrote it a couple of years ago, Refuting ISIS, very short treatise. He wrote it in Arabic, then he himself translated it into English. You can probably find it online, which is an ideological refutation of what ISIS is saying, right? And he is a master of the Quran and the Hadith. He is a bona fide Muslim scholar studying in the laps of scholars since he was five years old, right? So that's on one front. It must be battled ideologically and also military, militarily. They must be opposed. The Prophet Muhammad, he said that there was a group at his, uh, shortly after his uh, death that he prophesied, according to many uh, scholars. He called them the Khawarij or the Seceders, the Karajites. And he said uh, that they are, they are people that sort of come in waves every so often. This kind of fire and brimstone type of theology, very exclusivist, my way or the highway type of thing. Um, so I think that uh, whatever form, you know, that, uh, that there are many forms of this type of radical ideology. What I, well, the analogy I like to use for people is, and, and this kind of puts things in perspective for people, I say um, ISIS is to Islam as the Ku Klux Klan is to Christianity. So I think you can understand that, right? If you talk to a clan, a clansman, he'll justify everything he does from the Bible. Oh, the curse of Ham! They're supposed to be our slaves! They used to quote this in the halls of Congress at the time of Abraham Lincoln. This is, this is our destiny. This was supposed to happen in Congress, right? Yeah, it's amazing, right? So you'll, you'll, fi you'll, so you'll find people justifying things through a text. That's, that's justify anything through a text. This is very, very common, 
right? Uh, but I think we need to have substantive, rigorous scholarship, right? Oftentimes when, uh, when a young man, you know, he kind of uh, lives a life of sin and then he comes into religion, he starts to become very judgmental of people, right? He becomes sanctimonious. So what does my father know? He has an accent or something, right? Uh, he's never, st I, I know Arabic now, I studied, uh, so uh, I think that's common across the board. So we have to, so we have to uh, make sure that when we educate our children, uh, that we give them, and this is just my opinion, I think that religion has to be a part of children's lives uh, because hope in God, I think, is fundamental to the human nature. Uh, and you don't want someone to go into a state of total despair and then suddenly discover God and then just run with God and to, and towards you know, some sort of extreme position. It must be given in dosages. Um, so, to, again, make a long story short, there must be an ideological front against it as well as a military front against it. What do you believe happens when we die? <laughs> well, so... <clears throat> Um, the, there's a lot of hadith literature on this, to make a long story short. Uh, when a person dies, uh, they enter what's known as the barzakh. So the afterlife, which is called al-akhira in Arabic, begins right at death. When you die, you enter into the afterlife, as it were. So there's a, there's a time in the grave, uh, the sepulcher life, um, and then Muslims believe and a person could be in their grave for thousands of years. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that a person will be resurrected in, in body uh, um, from the grave and it'll feel like a night of sleep, even though he might have been dead for thousands of years. And then there's a standing on a concourse and then there's a judgment. Muslims believe in the day of judgment. And then there's two destinations, right? Um, so Muslims believe in heaven and hell. Uh, the dominant opinion is that both are eternal. There are some sort of minority opinions about hell, that hell eventually is sort of stomped out, as it were, by God's foot, according to a hadith, in no anthropomorphic sense. Uh, God is absolutely transcendental above space-time and materiality. Uh, another hadith says that everyone will eventually come out of hell and go into paradise, but these are minority opinions. It is absolutely forbidden for a Muslim to condemn anyone to hell. You know, I've been condemned to hell by people of other religions. It's happened to me multiple times um, uh, because the people condemning me believe that they have a personal guarantee that they're going to heaven, a personal guarantee. So in our tradition, there's a hadith of the Prophet that says, Man qala la ilaha illallah bi sidqin daqala jannah. Whoever says there's no God but God with sincerity will enter paradise. It doesn't say my name. It gives you an ideal. So I hope, hope is very important. Hope is a very important thing. I hope that I can live up to this ideal, but I don't have a personal guarantee. But at the same time, we are told many, many, many times that God is merciful, he's loving, he forgives sin, and that he loves his creation. So we have a good opinion, good opinion of God. Um, I think... Uh, I maybe have time for one more question. There is no compulsion in religion, in quotes. Does Islam allow conversions to other religions? Does Islam allow conversions? Um, does it allow, I don't know if I understand the question. I mean, in Judaism, at least in Orthodox Judaism, um, if you convert out of Judaism, it's not accepted generally. You still have to do all 613 bits of vote because you're ethnically Jewish. So you can pretend like you're Christian and do only the seven Noahidic laws, but in reality, I mean, that's the understanding from a traditional Talmudic perspective. But uh, in Islam, I mean, does, does Christianity allow conversions to other religions? I mean, what does that even, does it? It allows? I don't know what that means. <laughs> I think what you mean to say is, if you convert out of Islam, do they kill you? Is that what you mean to say? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about, let's, let's make it clear. Apostasy laws, 
right? Again, we look at apostasy laws. The origins of these laws is a pre-modern context, right? When a person's religious affiliation and political allegiance were one and the same. There's no separation of church and state, of mosque and state. Uh, the default state of the world back then was one of perpetual warfare, empires vying for land. There's always something happening at the frontier. That's why, you know, you go out there for a year and you fight, then you come back. And that's, that was the way of the world at the time. So apostasy was seen as political treason. That's not a reality anymore. The underlying principle has changed. So you have people in Muslim-majority countries, by the thousands becoming Christian, nothing happens to them. This happens all the time. You know, in, in America, you have people converting to different... That, that rea that we now we live in a different reality of secularism, of the nation-state, a person's religious identity and um, political allegiance are not one and the same. Right? So I don't, I don't, personally, I don't believe that there's room for any type of, I mean, if you look at Aquinas' Summa Theologica, again, it's very clear that he says the penalty for leaving Catholicism is death. That's what he says. In Deuteronomy 13, same type of thing. If your neighbor or brother or whoever entices you to worship another god, your hand should be the first to stone him. Right? So we're battling with nations here. Right? Leaving the religion, there are many people at the time of the Prophet Muhammad who left Islam. He didn't do anything to them. He completely left them alone. There are many examples of this. Okay, I have to stop on that note. All right, again, wanted to extend our gr deepest gratitude. Thank you again, Dr. Aliyathai, for coming in. Um, just to make your TSA screening that much more, much more challenging, we did get you a, a small gift. So <laughs> thank you again. Um, for uh, Yes, another round of applause, please. Now, I do recognize, oh, thank you guys for a standing ovation. That's right, for Dr. Ali Adai. He's going to be making his exit. All right, Elvis is leaving the building. Okay. Now, thank you again, Dr. Elliot. I, I know a lot of you had questions that did not get answered tonight. We do apologize. We had such great programming, though, that we wanted to get through tonight. What I would encourage, if you have questions remaining for Dr. Elliot, I, please do feel welcome to email those to us, and we will forward that information to him. Let's see if we can still get you the responses you desire. Um, the email address I will give you is pr at islamcenter.com. Again, that is pr at islamcenter.com. If you happen to misplace that email address, it is um, listed on our ICNEV website as well. Now, um, as we wrap up, the ICNEV board wanted to take a moment to thank all of those that helped organize this e event, including Brother Safraz, the lead event organizer. He's way too humble to be acknowledged. Oh, he's back there. We got him. All right. He's the man walking up. <laughs> Okay, we also wanted to thank the ICNEV Interfaith Events Committee, the ICNEV volunteers, and most importantly, Imam Motaz for continuing to guide our community to remain on God's path towards righteousness. Um, you are welcome back anytime, of course, to our mosque. We do ha hold congregation prayers on Fridays at 12.30 and 2.45 p.m. Please also contact us in case you're interested on making um, an appointment for a more dedicated time or tour for the facility. Remember to grab a free copy of your translated Quran as you exit, like, like I mentioned, it's in English. Um, and um, remember, we're exiting out of the wooden doors in the back. In case you did park in overflow parking at Desert Mountain High School, there will be a shuttle that will be coming back and forth at that uh, pickup location and we'll drop you off directly to the parking lot. Like I mentioned, feedback forms on the tables. We would love to get your feedback because we want to continue to serve you. Um, we want to make sure that we're providing interfaith opportunities that you know, you guys are interested in. And if you enjoy tonight's event, please spread the word. Um, we're definitely an open community. We want you guys to come. And so thank you again for attending this evening. And if all it takes is one act that earns us paradise, I sincerely pray that joining each other tonight in peaceful conversation and sharing a meal together is our ticket to the highest of heavens. Amen. Thank you.